right. Um, thanks everyone for joining us today for our last seminar of the semester. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Adam. Adam is assistant professor in the Department of Mathematics at University of Toronto. His research focuses on mathematical biology, scientific computing, and stochastic processes with applications to gene expression and neural networks. So today he will share with us some of the related work about a simulation of the electrical activity of retinal tissue and electroretinal gram design. Okay, uh, you can see my slides. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you about uh, a simulation that I've been working on uh, of the, the retina and it's a, a very detailed simulation. And uh, there are lots of applications. So I'll, I'll talk about three different applications and one of them will be uh, about the design of electroretinograms. Uh, so this is in uh, collaboration with my, my PhD student Bilal. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm gonna start from the ground up and, and I'm gonna work, work up uh, uh, to the whole tissue. So I'll first tell you about uh, some, some cell models. So, so models of the electrical activity of individual cells on the retina. And I'll show you an application uh, of uh, intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. Uh, then I'll go to networks of cells and, uh, and, and I'll give you an application uh, about uh, gap junctions in rods. Then uh, we'll go to the tissue level. So trying to simulate the entire retina, the electrical activity of the entire retina. And there I'll give you the application of this uh, electroretinogram design. Okay, so just some quick orientation. So the retina is the back of the eye and uh, uh, light comes through the, the cornea and, and through the lens. And then it hits the back of the, the, the retina where electrically active, uh, the back of the eye, the retina, where electrically active uh, cells detect that light. It converts the, the, uh, the light signal into an electrical signal that is sent to the brain for, for more processing. And the retina, so on the, on the right, I have a, a, a cross section of, of the retina, slice through the retina, and it, it has three layers of cells. So the, the, the top of this diagram uh, is uh, closest to where the light comes in. So the light comes in from the top and goes down through this tissue. And, uh, and, and it, the light is detected at the, the, the back of the, the retina, and that's the input layer, so the, the the rods and cones do the, they're the photoreceptors. They do the detection of the light. They pass their information on to uh, bipolar cells, which are in the middle. Uh, different columns of these cells are connected through horizontal cells and amacrine cells. And then uh, the final output layer is the, the ganglion cell layer. Uh, so I, I, have I have found in the literature uh, individual um, conductance-based models of uh, each of these cell types, and I've put it all into the big model. So I want to give you a little bit of the details of one individual, or two individual cell models. So the first uh, uh, place to start is uh, how do we describe the electrical activity of rods? So uh, rods are at the back of the eye. Uh, it's, it's a little bit strange to think that light has to pass through all of the other cell layers to get to where it's detected, right? It, you might think that the retinal ganglion cells might cast a shadow on the rods, uh, and, and it might make more sense to put the photo, uh, uh, the photo detectors right up front where the light comes in. But it turns out that um, detecting light this, uh, in, these, um, in the rods and the cones is quite energy intensive. And so they actually need to be close to where the blood supply is. Uh, so, so they're at the back and you just have to put up with these, these occasional shadows uh, that you get. So, uh, so we have a conductance-based model. Uh, we pulled it out uh, of the literature. It was made by Kamiyama in the in 1996. And uh, they did patch clamp experiments where they patch onto these cells, they shine light, and they figured out what uh, channels were in the uh, cell membrane and the, the little um, uh, segments uh, uh, inside the rod uh, that does the phototransduction. So phototransduction is, is pretty complicated. Uh, the basic idea is there's a rhodopsin, which is a RH here, and it sits in, in, um, in these compartment 
membranes. And when uh, a photon hits this uh, protein, it changes shape, it becomes activated rhodopsin. And then there's a, a signaling cascade that ultimately affects channels on the outer membrane and causes a hyperpolarization. So the, the input output relationship for a rod is light comes in and the membrane voltage uh, goes down It hyperpolarizes, comes, becomes more polarized. And uh, so there's a 23 variable ODE that describes the, the gating variables associated with these various uh, currents uh, and, and the internal biochemical reactions that take place to do the signaling and, and, and the, the, the processing, the phototransduction pathway that takes light in and causes it to have hyperpolarized uh, membrane voltages. Uh, so we have this, this detailed model. And uh, the output, you know, what, what, so now once we've implemented that, that model, um, uh, you can give a pulse of light. So here is uh, on the bottom, I have uh, the, the intensity of the photons and it's just going to do a pulse. And it's actually gonna be a very short pulse of just 20 milliseconds. So I'm gonna have a 20 milliseconds pulse. And then I'm gonna vary, uh, you know, from one up to 10, uh, up to a thousand, the intensity, the brightness of that, that flash of light. So it's one cell, one rod receiving a pretty brief 20 millisecond uh, uh, pulse. And then the model predicts and was fit to data of what the, the voltage would look like after that pulse. So you'll first notice that it takes a, a little bit uh, of time, maybe a, another 20 milliseconds before the rod can even notice that there was light at all. And then the and then the um, another striking feature of the rod response to light is that uh, it persists for quite a while. So uh, so if it's a very bright light, the the membrane won't voltage won't return back to equilibrium until like ten seconds later. This twenty millisecond pulse of light uh, uh, has a lasting effect for ten seconds. Uh, so this this depends on what sort of um, initial configuration the rod was in, this was a dark adapted rod. So the rod wasn't expecting to see light. It saw a bright flash of light, it responded pretty quickly, and then it remembered that it had a, the light uh, exposure for quite some time. Uh, so so I'm, I'm building up components. Uh, so I, I, I've looked a little bit about this rod model. We've also found in the literature models of cones uh, the you know the, the different color types uh, uh, red green and blue the they the really the difference is just the details of the opsin molecule so the models are very similar the parameters are just slightly different uh, and then and then we have models of the bipolar cells the amacrine cells the horizontal cells the retinal ganglion cells and uh, and and various subtypes so the the, the retina is pretty complicated uh, for example bipolar cells there's at least two different versions there's on and off versions. Uh, and, and, and so we've, we've assembled all of this and in, in, in collected all these uh, 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 conductance-based models out of the literature. Now, uh, uh, and, and so I don't want to just take from the literature. I, I want to mention that I'm, gonna, I'm also going to contribute to the literature. So I will tell you about another type of cell in the retina, these intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. And then the, I developed a conductance-based model for these cells. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. So uh, for a long time, it was believed that uh, the only photoreceptors on the, the retina were the rods and cones, that none of the other cells could directly detect light, right? Their, their knowledge of the light hitting the retina were indirect via the rods or the cones. Uh, but it wasn't, um, so it was relatively recently uh, that it was discovered that some retinal ganglion cells, a, a very small number, so so there, there might be millions of retinal ganglion cells in a small patch of, of the retina, uh, but how many of them are intrinsically photosensitive? Maybe there might be a hundred or a thousand total on the entire retina. So, so there's a very small subpopulation of retinal ganglion cells that are able to directly detect light. And they do this because they have their own opsin protein and it's uh, uh, melanopsin and, uh, and, and it, these retinal ganglion cells can direct, directly detect light. So 
why would you want cells that can directly detect light when you have very good rods and cones? Uh, well, IPRGCs uh, have a specific task. So some of the IPRGCs are different subtypes. There's at least six different subtypes of IPRGCs. Uh, some of them are responsible for things like the uh, pupil response. So there's a direct measurement of light to decide how big the pupil should be open or closed. And, and it doesn't, it, we don't want to have any processing in the brain for that. It's all just going to be done on the retina through these uh, intrinsically photosensitive retina ganglion cells. Uh, the retina detects light not just for, for vision, uh, but also for signaling other parts of the brain like the circadian clock. So we have a group of cells in your brain uh, that's located in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. I'll tell you a little bit about more about that later. Uh, but the, the SCN, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, needs to know about light in order to entrain to the light-dark signal. Like the internal clock has to be set by sunrise and sunset. So it needs to know about light. And it gets that knowledge about the world by a subpopulation of the retinal ganglion cells, the M1 IPRGCs. Likewise, the, the IGL is another part of the brain that wants to know about light. In this, and and uh, so the M4 IPRGCs signal to the, the IGL. So uh, uh, there wasn't, you know, these IPRGCs are, are relatively uh, newly discovered. So there wasn't a model, uh, a conductance based model. Uh, so I hypothesized that there is one that consists of a sodium, a potassium, and a calcium gated, uh, voltage gated ion channels. Uh, the leak, we also included a leak channel, this, uh, this here, but it, it doesn't really matter if you have that or not. Uh, it's not really important for the model. Uh, and then it has five gating variables, M, H, N, R, and F. And uh, so you just assume this Hodgkin Huxley style uh, uh, model. And then we uh, had a collaborator, uh, 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 actually one of the people who first discovered IPRDCs, uh, do some patch clamp uh, experiments on them and uh, collected data. So here is uh, measurements of the calcium current, right? So you can put different chemical blockers to, to separate whether you're looking at the sodium current or the potassium current or the calcium current. So these circles are time averaged uh, measurements of the, the calcium current. And then the solid line is uh, me searching lots and lots of uh, parameter space to find a best fit. So. Uh, and, and these are just a small subset of the, the measurements we use to, to fit the parameters. Uh, if you're interested, here's what the uh, uh, M, H, N, R, and F uh, time scales and, and, and quasi equilibrium functions as a function of voltage look like. And uh, there's uh, two curves on each plot. Uh, one is black for the M4 subtype and uh, blue is for the M1 subtype. Uh, so, so we've developed this, this model uh, and uh, we can look at uh, uh, current clamp experiments. So where you, you inject a fixed constant amount of current and then you measure the voltage. So, uh, so the first upper row is for M1. These are the IPRGCs that talk to the circadian clock. And then there's the uh, M4 IPRGCs they're, they're morphologically different uh, and they have a different role. They, 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 they communicate to the, uh, the IGL. And uh, these two columns in the middle correspond to left data and right model. And these are not fit curves, these are uh, validation curves. Uh, so I, you know, I think if I didn't tell you which one was model and which one was data, maybe you could figure it out because it's, the left looks a little bit noisier, but um, it, it's, it's still a very good validation. And then uh, for the firing rate, you can, as a function of the injected current into these, these IPRGCs, you can measure the firing rate. And uh, for a validation, it's very good for the M4 cells and the model sort of under, uh, uh, under counts uh, uh, spikes. Uh, partly because, you know, way up here at the high, after the depolarization block, we have a, a large injected current. You know, I, these little wiggles you're seeing, maybe they're not actually spikes, but you're counting them as spikes. So, um, but, but uh, so we have, I, I've contributed to the literature, a, a conductance based model I didn't just take from the literature. <laughs> um, uh, a bit of an aside, because I, I think it's a, a nice thing that you can do once you have a, a model that you believe in. Uh, you can sort of plug it into other models. 
So, uh, so I would like to actually study how the IPRGCs signal to the uh, IGL or the, circa uh, the circa site of the circadian clock, the, the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So you can just see where these, ob these are located. The uh, SCN is right where the optic nerves cross. It's like perfectly, it sits on top of the optic nerve. It's like the perfect spot to receive visual input. You know, the light is important to, to, to train the circadian clock. So it gets a predominant location. Uh, so uh, what I wanna know is how does the, uh, the, the, the membrane voltage uh, propagate down the axon. And so I have a, an active cable equation for that. Uh, and then I uh, can say take for uh, uh, an M1 cell, I can uh, take its voltage, membrane voltage in the soma, plug it through that cable equation and figure out what at the axon terminal it looks like. And then I can uh, look at different uh, levels of the uh, applied current. So what tends to happen is if you inject too much current into these IPRGCs, their, their spikes get really, really tiny and maybe not well-defined. And, and so the question is, if, if it's not having very well-defined spikes, is that still propagating down the axon? And it turns out that the, 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 uh, the axons of IPRGCs are well uh, uh, tuned to convert even just little tiny spikes into well-defined spikes. So you can see even for the M1 cell where the current injected current is quite high, you get these, these little tiny uh, spikes at the, volt, at the somatic side, but at the uh, axon terminal in blue, you have these well, nice well-defined spikes. And, and a similar ha story happens for M4 cells, but the, the M4 cells, you can put a lot of current into them and they, they'll keep spiking. They'll just, their frequency just keeps growing. Uh, so because I, I regularly study the SCN, I'll take you on a, a little bit of an aside here uh, uh, into a, a model of how the IPRGCs actually talk to the SCN. So this is a, uh, uh, a model of the electrical activity of SCN neurons. They have a, a, a sodium, a potassium, and uh, two types of calcium currents, uh, long and non-long type. Uh, and then there's a potassium, uh, a calcium gated potassium channel. Uh, and, and, and so this is sort of a well-established model, this Diekman 2013 uh, uh, developed this model in sort of this exact same style as I did for the IPRGCs. And then uh, what I need to do is connect the the signal that has been propagated down the axon through the synapses into an SCN neuron model. So the, the synapses, there's, there's two types of them, uh, AMPA and NMDA. Uh, there's two types of neurotransmitters that, that, that affect that uh, excitatory synapse, and we've built a model of that. Uh, so, so all that uh, uh, being said, uh, I can study uh, as I inject different currents into the either M1 or M4 IPRGC, what is the resulting firing rate in an SCN neuron? So what's plotted in color is as a function of the injected current into the uh, IPRGC and the time of day. So this, this SCN conductance based model, the parameters vary over the course of the day. In particular, two of the potassium related maximal conductances, they vary over the course of the day and that affects the firing rate. So the SCN neurons fire a lot during the day and not so much at night. And, uh, and, and so I can change those parameters uh, in the SCN uh, conductance based model to determine what time of day it is. So as a function of time of day and how much current I'm injecting into the IPRGC, uh, in color is the ratio of firing rates. And uh, you just sort of blur your eyes and you can see that there's a lot more yellow and uh, higher ratio uh, uh, colors when I connect an M1 IPRGC to the SCN. But if I connect the M4 IPRGC to the SCN, it doesn't do a very good job. It has low ratios. It's not doing a good job signaling. Its messages are not being received by the SCN. And this makes perfect sense because uh, M1 cells uh, actually in, in, in your 
brain are connected to the SCN, M4 cells are not connected to the SCN. This is an artificial connection. And so we, we make this case that um, the, the differences between M1 and M4 cells are meaningful and uh, they are designed, they're tuned in a sense to, to do their task. So if they're, if they're in the case of the M1 cell talking to the SCN, they're, they're tuned to do that. So they can signal effectively to the SCN. Uh, we have also looked that M4 IPRGCs are tuned to talk to the IGL, but I haven't presented that result yet. All right, so that's the end of the aside into IPRGCs and the SCN. So, uh, so we talked about individual cell models. So let's go to uh, the next level up, which is a network of, of, of uh, electrically active cells on the, uh, on the SCN, or sorry, on the retina. Uh, oh, there's a question. I'm happy to answer questions. So is clock time such that zero is midnight, so natural light? Ah, so, so this is, I'll go back. Uh, so uh, clock time is uh, uh, CT time, which means hours relative to when you think sunrise is. So uh, let's say sunrise is 6 a.m., then zero is 6 a.m., and then six would be noon. So uh, okay, so thank you. Yeah, yeah. So zero to 12 is what's called the subjective day, and 12 to 24 is the subjective night if you're on a 12 12 day length. So uh, yeah, that, so that's, that's the definition of clock time. Okay, so, uh, so back to the retina. And uh, so here's an image uh, uh, of the retina and it's set up so that uh, the, it's, you can visualize the rods. So all these little hexagons are, are rods. And then these uh, darker spots are cones. They're, they're stained to be darker. Uh, and and uh, so I just want to point out that um, the rods tile the retina. There's no space for, for light to get through. I mean, this is in the center. At the per periphery of the retina, they're spaced out a little bit more. So there is possibility that, that light could get out. Um, uh, but uh, uh, the, the rods tile, so, so no light's going to get through. And they tile very much like hexagons. So they're connected to their... Uh, uh, or they're, they're physically beside six neighbors. And, uh, and then if you study a little bit about how they actually are electrically connected to the neighbors, they're gap junctionally coupled. So uh, rods are gap junctionally coupled and they're, uh, 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 and so gap junctions are little, literally tunnels between the two cells that allow ions to pass. And uh, they, they can be regulated to be open or closed. Uh, and uh, so when we build our model of a population of rods, we're gonna take copies of our original conductance-based rod model, and then we're gonna couple them in some way, and we're gonna couple them with gap junctions. So, so my model of, of a rod network now is the exact same ODE previously, CM, DVDT is sum of currents, these different currents, but now all the currents and the voltage needs to be indexed by which cell I'm on. And then there's a network of uh, uh, gap junction uh, coupling. So uh, my model for gap junctions uh, is uh, just like uh, uh, Ohm's law. So, so there's a current that depends on the difference of voltages between the, the two uh, cells. And uh, uh, that gives rise to a current that can affect the membrane voltage. Uh, Okay, so uh, I'm going to take from the, 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 this uh, microscope image and, and lay out my cells on a, 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 a hexagonal grid and each cell is going to be connected with its six neighbors. Uh, and then I, I look up uh, the, this gap junctional, uh, this conductance of the gap junction uh, is, is a, a value you can get out of the literature. And so then I see uh, and then I, I make sure the spacing, uh, the, the physical space uh, it, it is, is set properly, uh, mostly by this image up here. So, so this red bar is uh, 10 micrometers. Uh, and then I, I take that and I give a flash of light. So uh, here on the left is the stimulus. So all the cells that fall on this light get some amount of light, uh, some you know, rate of photons coming in and activating rhodopsin and then causing a hyperpolarization. And then plotted on the right is the resulting uh, voltage after a, a little bit of a delay. So in principle, this should be a movie where there's this depression and that goes away. Um, 
but I'll just show you one, one still of that movie. And you can see that uh, where the light is shining, there's this drop in, in voltage. Uh, but what's striking is that it's blurred out quite a bit, right? So, so your dot, your point of light that should probably have only hit maybe 40 or so um, uh, uh, rods is much is quite a bit larger. The, you know, the radius of this dot is is maybe twice as big, and your dot this has the effect of blurring dots or or any kind of image that's going to fall on this network of rods is going to be blurred. This is not surprising given that uh, this this term that cause that that's gap junction is really just diffusion on the lattice. So, so I'm, I'm diffusing the voltage through adjacent neighboring uh, 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 neurons. And, and, and so of course the voltage gets blurred out. But if, if the voltage is what is ultimately given to the brain as, as an image, this makes your image blurry. And so you really have to wonder why would you gap junctionally couple rods, right? What, what's the purpose of this gap junctional coupling? So being uh, uh, a circadian biologist uh, some of the time, uh, naturally, I was thinking about uh, 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 how this system varies over the course of the day. And, uh, and oh, well, okay, I'll pause my segue. Okay, so, so uh, but before I get uh, talking about uh, uh, the, the circadian variation in this gap junctional coupling, uh, I should tell you a little bit about how to solve this, this very large ODE. Right, so I, I, I potentially want to do millions of rods, uh, but I, I face quite a bit of challenging. The dynamics are very stiff because I've mashed together sort of different uh, uh, physics. So there's time scales associated with the light. There's time scales associated with the gating variables, how quickly they uh, uh, the gates open and close. The calcium dynamics has another whole set of time scales. The G protein signaling cascade uh, it has different time scales. And, and so I'm just, I'm, I, the, the ODE is very, very stiff. That's even before I add the gap junction coupling, which is like diffusion, which is an additional source of stiffness. So, uh, so I, 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 I have my own uh, time stepping routine to solve this. Uh, I use a backwards differentiation formula. And in order to step forward in time with a backwards differentiation formula, you need to solve and quasi Newton works, works quite well. So I only need to uh, typically have five or six uh, uh, Newton iterations, and I only need to update the Jacobian matrix every few time steps. So, um, so it works pretty well. And uh, in my admittedly crummy implementation in MATLAB, I can easily do you know 10,000 rods in in real time. So the criterion that I'm striving for is being able to simulate in real time. So I can do 10 uh, uh, 10,000 rods in real time. Okay, so. So back to the question of uh, 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 why would you bother gap junction? What, what's the benefit for the retina of gap junctionally coupling rods? So, uh, so we found some experiments uh, uh, where they give a pulse of light. I think it was a 40 millisecond pulse of light. And, uh, and then they measured the deflection in membrane voltage in, in, the, in the rods. So they're patched onto the rods. They're getting the trace of voltage, membrane voltage is a function of time. And then the data they chose to report is this maximal deflection. So here it would be like 20 uh, millivolts maximal deflection. And they did the experiment uh, uh, at both uh, the middle of the day and the middle of the night. And they get different maximal deflections. So uh, in the nighttime, the maximal deflections are smaller. And during the daytime, their maximal deflections are, are larger. And the units are a little bit strange here. Uh, light, so uh, R star stands for activated rhodopsin. So the, the x-axis is the total number of uh, activated rhodopsin molecules over the course of the, uh, per rod, uh, over the course of, of the total light. Whereas um, in the model, we have uh, uh, you know, an intensity of photons. So there has to be some conversion, but we've, we've gone and figured that out. Uh, all right, so what do we have to play with in our model? Uh, we, well, we're gonna vary this gap junctional coupling. So we're gonna give the same pulse to one, the, the, the experiment um, uh, 
the spot, size of the light is the size of a rod. So they're, they're, they're supposing that they're stimulating a single rod that they're patched onto. They also patch onto neighboring rods, but uh, I'm not using that data. Uh, so, uh, so I stimulate just this one uh, rod in blue. I simulate the whole network. And, uh, and then I, I do a parameter sweep, uh, both in the, the light, the total light intensity and the x-axis, and then in color, this parameter for the gap junction uh, uh, coupling. And, uh, you know, I, I, I look at this and it looks like it has the same, same rough shape. Uh, so, um, so it starts low and goes high. Uh, and then what this allows us to say is to pose a hypothesis that perhaps the gap junction coupling strength, right, the conductance, how much of these gap junctions are open or closed, uh, uh, depend, de depends on the course of the day. And uh, notice that the this, this signs work out. So in the daytime, we have a more green colored gap junctional uh, coupling value that's lower. So lower conductance during the day, higher conductance at night. And that, that sort of makes sense if, if we're supposing that the purpose of the gap junctions is to average noise. So during the uh, uh, night, when there are not very many photons coming in, uh, you don't want to rely on the single photon detection mechanism in the rods. You sort of want to average neighboring rods. So it's probably good to have a large gap junctional coupling at night so that you average over a, a, a bunch of cells to sort of average over the noise, the low photon noise. But uh, during the day, you don't want to do that because it'll just blur your image. Uh, because there are lots of photons and you're going to detect enough of them to, to get a good signal. So, so that's our hypothesis. I, I have a question. Yeah. How is it obvious how this maximum deflection is connected to that uh, sort of blurring radius? Because I, I guess you've told us how that increasing this, uh, this coupling constant will change this blurring radius, but it's not clear to me, at least, how that connects to this uh, deflection. Ah, so the deflection is measured in one cell in the middle. So, okay. so it's like the, the more blurred it is, the lower the response is in any one cell. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So uh, that concludes the application uh, at the, the network of cells level. Uh, so I want to keep going higher. I want to look at uh, the tissue level. So I want to simulate the entire retina. Now, um, uh, there are a lot of cells on the retina. And, and so it becomes infeasible to simulate them all. Uh, so I'm going to do uh, 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 some homogenization to get a PDE that lives on the, the retina and the rest of the eye. Uh, and then I'm going to discretize and solve that PDE. And so essentially, I, yeah, so, um, so here's the domain. The, my eye is a sphere, and the, this cap in red is the, the, the retina at the back. And we've also decided to not just uh, have the retina act as a boundary condition. We're going to actually have like a 3D volume uh, for the retina. So it has some, some tiny thickness. And this, this allows us to separate the layers of the cell. Um, uh, okay, so the framework we use is uh, uh, the bi-domain equations, but we need more than just two domains. So we call them the multi-domain equations. And the idea is uh, you're going to do some homogenization. So you're going to average uh, 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 very densely packed cells and to get an average voltage over that um, the region. And that's essentially going to convert my very large ODE into a PD. And uh, this is uh, this, these bi-domain equations. Uh, this framework has been uh, applied a lot for uh, a model of cardiac tissue. So we're really just uh, uh, borrowing um, the bi-domain equations for cardiac tissue and applying them to, to the, the retina. So uh, the general idea is that uh, every point on the retina is both inside and outside. It's, it's both outside of any cell and inside each of the cell types. So I'm gonna write down uh, electrostatic potentials that depend on space, but there are gonna be different electrostatic potentials depending on which compartment you're in. 
And uh, so the variables in the model are the uh, extracellular potential, uh, the potential um, uh, not uh, in, in space, not on the retina. And then there are potentials uh, inside each of the domains. And then, oh, I didn't write it, but the, the voltage that we've been uh, talking about before, so, so say the voltage, the membrane voltage on, on a rod is going to be uh, phi i, whatever uh, the Q index is for rods, minus phi e. Right? So that, that's an accessible uh, uh, quantity. Uh, and then the governing equations are essentially that no charge uh, uh, accumulates. So the sum of the, the flux densities uh, uh, needs to be zero, or the divergence of the flux density, some of the flux densities need to be zero. And then we can look at individual, uh, uh, say, uh, the, the jth compartment. In the, so cell type J. Uh, its intercellular flux uh, is going to be some conductance mu i and the gradient, so this is Ohm's law. And then uh, there's transmembrane currents. So previously, when we looked at individual cell models, those were transmembrane currents, giving changes in the, the, the voltage. Uh, so there's going to be the capacitive current, then there's the, the channel currents, and then we're going to keep in gap junctions because I like them. Uh, and and uh, this uh, 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 chi here is the volume to surface area ratio. So it converts things that live on the surface, uh, uh, like these transmembrane current densities, to volume currents that, that act as sources to the divergence of the, the flux. All right, so what we end up getting is uh, on the retina, we have um, uh, the conductance in the extracellular space times the gradient of the potential in the extracellular space, plus a sum over all these currents on the insides of, of all the various cells. And then, uh, 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 and, and then we have, um, there's two different perspectives. You can either look at this transmembrane current from the perspective of the inside of the cell or from the perspective of the outside of the cell. And I think there's a typo Yes, these should, you know, these are the same thing, right? Yes. So, so one of these should be E, right? So you can look at this transmembrane current as a source from the perspective of extra, extracellularly or intracellularly of each different possible um, uh, 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 cell type. And then, as I mentioned before, the voltage, uh, this, the, the, the cell membrane voltage for the J cell type. Uh, is a difference between its inside minus the outside uh, potential. And then uh, because we want to account for things like phototransduction, uh, associated with each cell type is a state vector, things like how much rhodopsin and how much inactivated rhodopsin and the reactivated rhodopsin and, and all the various sort of calcium quantities. So they go in a, a, a vector. So there's ODEs at each point in space that describe internal things that are happening in the cell like phototransduction. And then um, there are some boundary conditions uh, uh, on, on the, the boundary of the retina. And they're basically that the current can't accumulate on the boundary and the potentials are, are continuous. And then uh, away from the retina on the rest of the eye, we're just assuming that it's a passive electrical media. So the inside of the eye is, um, uh, composed of, it's called vitreous humor, it's an ionic solution, so it has some conductivity, we'll call that mu s. Okay, so uh, this is a challenging system of PDEs coupled with ODEs on the boundary. Uh, so, but the, uh, so we have linear elliptic equations for the functions that uh, live over space, and we just use cons conservative finite differences. We naturally work in spherical coordinates because the eye is a sphere, uh, and uh, most of the numerical stiffness doesn't come from the PD part, it comes from the ODEs, things like we talked about before when we're solving these, uh, the rod model. So again, we use a backwards differentiation formula, except uh, a fixed time step just doesn't, you know, it's too much uh, to do it. You need to adapt the time step. And so we, we have a way to extrapolate and interpolate uh, our backwards differentiation formula. So that basically when the lights turn on, the time step gets small. And then the time step gets larger uh, as things are becoming less uh, variable. Uh, 
we have a lot of um, very sparse linear solves to do uh, as a result of you know using Newton's method uh, to solve the, the backwards differentiation formula updates. Uh, so essentially, I've taken this uh, PDEs system of PDE linear elliptic PDEs with uh, ODEs on the boundary and and converted it into uh, some linear constraints on the updates and then some nonlinear constraints that I solved the nonlinear equations with Newton's method. All right, so let's look at an application of, of this tissue level model. And uh, uh, the application I like is the electroretinogram. So it's just like an EKG uh, where you measure the electrical activity of the heart by having uh, electrodes uh, near your heart. Well, you can measure the same thing for the retina, but the electrodes sit on the the surface of the eye. Uh, so shown here uh, is, is one electrode that causes the eye. The other electrode they usually put on the ear or the back of the neck. It's supposed to be the potential at infinity. And then uh, here's a, an ex experiment uh, or um, you know, in a clinical setting, you wouldn't call it an experiment. You call it a, you know, a test or a measurement. Uh, you give a flash of light. Uh, and then a little while later, you can detect a change in voltage difference between the electrode that's on the eye and the electrode that's on the ear. Uh, and this is definitely a dark adapted uh, uh, rod response uh, because of how long it takes for the, the flash to come on and then how long it persists. Uh, so uh, electrophysi cl clinical electrophysiologists uh, uh, can look at ERG measurements and diagnose diseases in particular, just like uh, uh, for EKGs, the cardiologists identify P, Q, R, S, T waves. Uh, well, the, the, uh, for electroretinograms, you enable, you, the waves are enabled A, B, C, sort of starting at the beginning of the alphabet. And uh, depending on the gap between the A wave and the B wave, how long it takes or the amplitude, you can diagnose different diseases. Uh, so, um, so I, I, I've been working with, with the clinical electrophysiologist, so I've been sort of learning the, the lingo, of exactly what uh, stimuli they use. They have um, maybe 30 or so standard stimuli. Um, uh, notice that this is a lot different than EKG. You get in a lot of trouble if you were to shock the heart to measure it, right? Um, uh, but uh, the, the eye, you, you can give light stimulus both depending on space and time, and then you can make measurements. So you have sort of a way of interacting with the system that's not really invasive, just you know, shining some light on the eye. So they have, um, uh, if, you, if you take a dark adaptive retina, so you ask them to sit in the dark for five minutes, uh, and you give a full field flash uh, of this intensity, uh, then that's a way to specifically measure how the rods are performing. Uh, if you give a brighter full field flash to a dark adaptive retina, that's a good way to measure how the rods and cones are interacting. Uh, if you just want uh, a cone response, an isolated cone response, then you give a full field flash of light uh, at this fairly bright um, level, but you make sure it's light adaptive so you filter out the rod response. Rods are, are tended, they, they function primarily at low light levels. And then you can do things like flicker. So. Here's just a repository of uh, the different stimuli and the types of responses you would see in an ERG, an electroretinogram. Uh, so I, I said I'm working with this clinical electrophysiologist, and he's given me some data. So here's various uh, light stimuli and the, the measurements. Uh, I think each one has four measurements. So there's, or some of them have just two or three, but there's the, in the different colors of the different measurements, they repeat the experiment. Uh, the measurements. And uh, uh, so he, here's the data. Actually, uh, so he, we haven't quite worked out a relationship yet where he can give me patient data. So this is actually his data, his personal, his eyes. Um, and a, a trained uh, 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 electrophysiologist can look at this and say, that's a healthy retina, uh, or that's a diseased retina. Uh, I'm not so good. I'm not trained in looking at these. So I would like to simulate these um, uh, this, these light stimuli on my retina model, and then uh, see if I can figure out what's working well or not uh, based on uh, using the simulation. So uh, here is a simulation of uh, my whole tissue model with a flash of light. Uh, hopefully that's playing. Okay, right. So uh, I'll loop it again. 
Okay, so there's a flash of light, it's brief. And then all I'm plotting on the right is the potential on the surface of the eye. Uh, you wouldn't be able to measure at the back of the eye. You can only measure really at the front of the eye. But these are the values you get. And, you know, they're, they're tiny. They're like, um, you know, 80 microvolts, right? These are very small things. I, and I, I, I'll regularly compare ERGs to EKGs. EKGs, are, there are big voltages that are easy to measure. These are very tiny voltages that, that you're measuring. Um, okay, so that's one of the, you know, a single flash of light. Uh, and that's the type of measurement my, my model gives. Uh, okay, here's a, a flashing stimulus. So hopefully it is. Yeah, so, uh, so I'm going to have uh, uh, five flash stimulus. And then uh, each time there's a flash, there's a voltage that's slightly delayed because the rods take a little while to detect the light. and send that through the G protein signaling cascade to affect the voltage, uh, which then affects the, the surface potential. But that's an elliptic equation, so it's instantaneous. But, uh, but anyway, here, here's me uh, running the ERG measurements in the model. OK, so uh, one thing that uh, one disease that ERGs are very good at diagnosing is uh, age-related macular degeneration. So here's just a camera image. You know, they just put a camera close up to the, 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 the eye and they're just taking a photograph of the retina. And you can very clearly see that there's something wrong, this yellow patch. So it turns out that this is a very late stage, uh, a case of uh, uh, macular degeneration where all the rods in this area are, are dead. They're just not working at all. And so the patient has like a blind spot. There's a circle they, they just cannot see in. Uh, it turns out that this is a very late stage case because you can actually see the damage. Um, in an, using an ERG, you can detect the damage well ahead of time. And yeah, there are treatments for AMD, not great, but some of them involve changing your diet and, and that can slow the, the, the degeneration. So, um, so, uh, so we want a really good way of diagnosing with ERGs. Um, uh, and actually the ERG diagnosis can happen even before the patient notices that they're, they're getting some blindness because the brain is very adaptive. If there's a small dark spot, it'll just fill in the gaps. Uh, so you might not even notice that you're having a blind spot, uh, but ERGs can, a, a trained clinical uh, uh, electrophysiologist can detect these. But uh, uh, I want to know if we could do a little bit better. So, uh, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, in the simulation, damage a part of the retina. And then I'm going to simulate. And I'm also going to make an ERG measurement. Now, for right now, I don't have this working in a clinic or anything. The ERG measurement is just a separate simulation of some hidden uh, area of damage. So I have the true area of damage that I simulate. And then I have a hypothesis for the damaged area that I'm going to simulate. Uh, the difference between those two are going to be the error. I'm going to just use the, the L infinity, the max difference between the two. And then I'm going to have two uh, adversarial optimizers. So the, uh, the hypothesis of what area is damaged is going to try and decrease the error. So I'm going to try and uh, the optimizer is going to try and move where I think the damage is to decrease the difference between the measurement and the simulation. But then I, I get to pick a stimulus. And so the stimulus where I flash the light, it's going to try and increase the error. So it's going to try and shine light so that there's a difference between the hypothesis and the true uh, uh, damage. OK, so, so here's roughly what it is. The eye is a sphere. And then uh, there's a, a, a circle where I'm going to cast light. The black region is where there is uh, true damage and the red region is where there's a hypothesis difference. And then this uh, X is on the front, the cornea, where I'm actually making the measurement. So, uh, so now I've sliced that eye through just for visualization. I'm going to plot the, the potential in the eye. Here's where I'm actually measuring. Uh, the X is where I'm measuring. So these curves are a flash of light. Uh, uh, spatially located to just where this yellow bar is. The black bar is the true damage. The red bar is the hypothesis damage. And then I'm going to have this adversarial optimization where you move the yellow to uh, make the difference between this red curve and the black curve below bigger. And then 
and then you update the and simultaneously you update the hypothesis damage region to decrease that error. So they fight against each other and hopefully we, we get a good result. So I just need to make a new share over here. Okay, so you should be able to see it and then I'll play it. And so then um, I'm, I'm showing in time what the voltage looks like after this flash. And then there's a discrete step where I update the light stimuli and the hypothesis on the damage. Uh, and so the curves should get, well, the, there's a fighting to try and make the clo curves closer together uh, or further or, 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 or closer together or further apart. And, uh, and, and they, they should, there, now it's got a really good estimate of the, the damage. So I'll play it again. So my, my red, my estimate is very, very bad, uh, but then I start expanding it and moving it. The light uh, expands and then narrows in. And uh, in the end, you know, take, these intermediate steps are not are making marginal improvements. The the light is just trying to make separate the difference between the hypothesis and the uh, uh, true, and and uh, eventually get a very good result uh, at the end. Uh, uh, yeah, where where the red is nearly on top of the black. Adam, could you say could you say something about? Um, What's the, I mean, it's clearly good if you can pinpoint where this macular degeneration is, but are there any like interventions that you can do? I mean, is it treated based on knowing the site of the degeneration or? Uh, it's treated on knowing the quantity of the degenerate. Like, yeah, so, so they want to know how bad is the degeneration. Uh, and you could roughly say, what's the area of this, of this damage? Got it. So, uh, so part of your this adversarial algorithm, it's not just moving like the center; it's also figuring out how large the. Um, yeah, yeah, that's part of an artifact of the uh, the drawing the two D slices. You can't see that the the circle is moving, the hypothesis circle is moving, and its radius is changing. Okay. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'll go back to my slides. You can see my slides, yeah. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, uh, so I have a detailed model of the electrical activity of the retina. I, I told you, I showed you just a fraction of, of the detail I have in there. Uh, it, one, one application is to be able to simulate and interpret uh, and design uh, ERG measurements. Uh, and uh, there's lots of future work. Uh, I'll be keeping graduate students busy for a while. So uh, the simulation needs to be, have. It, it, it's very sense if we want to be able to do this in real time so that we uh, in the clinic design the stimuli while the patient is sitting there we need to be able to simulate uh, uh, essentially real time uh, and and we're pretty close we're using uh, some some clever parallelization and and custom written numerical methods uh, we're using GPUs uh, but but we could, we could stand to improve a little bit um, and then uh, sort of a big thing that we haven't talked about is noise. So uh, the ERG measurements are quite noisy. These are small voltages you're measuring. And it'd be nice to just see this inverse problem. Where is the damage? How does that respond to noise? My, my feeling is that it, it's pretty sensitive to noise, but I, I, I wanna sort of uh, study that in detail. And then uh, is actually to apply this in the clinic. So I have a couple of grants that I've submitted to, to actually run this in a clinic. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, yeah, so thanks to my graduate student and my collaborator uh, at the Kensington Nye Institute, and uh, um, NSERC is, uh, is my sponsor for this work. So, uh, great, so I'm happy to answer questions. Great, thank you so much for such a nice talk. So now please feel free to ask Adam questions if you have any. So one, maybe I'll, I'll just ask one question. Um, it seems like at least from that one image you showed when this macular degeneration happens, it's kind of localized or maybe it sort of spreads out from some localized area. I mean, in principle, it could have been somehow dispersed throughout throughout the retina. Is that also something that you, your models could be used for kind of uh, simulating the progression of this degeneration and testing different ways that that could happen? 
Yeah, so in, in the simulation, I can damage whatever cells I want or whatever areas of cells I want or, or different cell types. So macular degeneration of, uh, specifically is, is for degeneration of the rods, but there are other diseases where the other uh, uh, cells have problems. Uh, so I can, I can damage whatever cells I want wherever I want, but for solving the inverse problem, as soon as you have like multiple regions or you're saying like I could damage potentially any region on this grid, there's just too many parameters for the inverse problem. So by making the assumption that the damage is localized and in a circle, uh, then I have fewer parameters for the inverse problem. And I can get success in finding that, at least in these synthetic experiments. And may maybe that's actually the relevant case, at least based on one data Right, so, so all the camera images of the, the late stage AMD, uh, they are like, like I showed circles, right? Uh, you know, I would say this is pretty circular. <laughs> um, but uh, and uh, is there? I mean, is there a reason to think why it should be like? Do you do you have any reason to think why if one of these cells dies, then maybe its its neighbor is also going to become damaged in some way? Yeah, yeah. The the mechanism of the disease is uh, insufficient supply of nutrients, mm -hmm. and and okay. so that's that's the. Um, that you know, that's the the vascular network behind. That's you know that that's connects them. So nearby rods are likelier to die. <laughs> uh, the de the death of the rods is correlated because of the shared food supply. Uh, but this may only be true for late stage sort of AMD. The the purpose would be to detect before it's visually you know uh, obvious. So maybe when it's not so visually obvious, maybe death is happening sort of all over the place. So. These are some of the challenges we'll face when we actually got to apply this in a clinical setting. Okay. Do you have any other questions for Adam? All right, um, I guess we will just wrap up here for today. I'd like to thank our speaker, Adam, again and everyone for your participation and support throughout the semester. Um, have a nice day and I will see you all in the coming fall. Take care.